Today we're going to be talking about how jurors make decisions. As we've said before, the juror's role is to decide the facts of the case. The judge decides the matters of law. Now in jurisdictions that have no laypersons acting as jurors, the judge will decide both the facts of the case and the matters of law. In an earlier presentation, we learned that jurors and judges are affected by largely the same factors when making their decisions. So in this video, when we talk about how jurors make decisions, we're really just talking about how deciders of fact make their decisions. So how does the law see the juror's role? Let's look at the juror's handbook from Queensland in Australia. This is a pretty typical statement of the juror's role. There, the juror's role is to make the most important decision in any court case, whether or not the accused is guilty as charged, or in civil cases, who is at fault. They bring to the task a wealth of experience, common sense and insight. So as we said, they have to decide the facts of the case based on the evidence presented at trial. And to do that, they bring their life experience and common sense. In psychology, there's a lot of research looking at how people use their life experience and common sense to make decisions. We generally call these things schemas, stereotypes and heuristics. A stereotype is pretty much a mental representation of information about a social category and can include information about whether we feel positively or negatively about people from that category and also information about what people from that category are like, so their attributes and the sorts of behaviours that they perform and the roles that they occupy. A stereotype is a specific example of what we call a schema. A schema can apply to a range of other types of things as well. Heuristics are quick decision rules or shortcuts that we learn from our experiences. We'll be talking about how some of these things may influence jurors' decisions. It's important when we're talking about this research, however, to understand that we're not trying to make a case that jurors are not up to doing their job, despite what some people might think about jurors. A better instrument could scarcely be imagined for achieving uncertainty, capriciousness, lack of uniformity, disregard of former decisions, utter unpredictability. Instead, the point we're making is that jurors are just people and that all of us are affected by schemas, stereotypes and heuristics. The reason why it's important to study these things in the context of jury decision making is not to specifically criticise jurors, but to understand how these normal aspects of social cognitive functioning affect jurors in their role. We want to know what factors exacerbate the effect of these things and what factors inhibit them. When are they specifically problematic and when are they not so problematic? Once we know these things, we may well be able to provide the support to jurors and structure their task in such a way as to limit any adverse effect on their decisions. So you can perhaps think about it this way. The research helps us to identify possible problems with how jurors are asked to perform their job, not with problems with individual jurors. It's also worth noting that the single biggest influence on jurors' decisions is the strength of the evidence against the defendant. So generally, jurors do a reasonable job, but there are ways they could be better supported because research shows that factors beyond just the evidence affect their decisions. So how do jurors make their decisions? One of the main models that describes how jurors make their decisions is called the cognitive story model. This model was proposed originally by Pennington and Hastie. According to the story model, jurors construct narrative stories during the trial to organise and interpret the evidence. Jurors then evaluate and interpret all subsequent evidence as it is presented in line with that story. Jurors' schemas and stereotypes are useful in forming the story, especially for understanding missing aspects of the story. These schemas and stereotypes provide templates for what certain types of people and events are like. Schemas and stereotypes, as we said, are based on our prior knowledge of these events. They're like our theories for what things are like. They're generally functional and using them is normal because they help us deal with a large amount of information in our day-to-day -day lives. However, because they can sometimes be inaccurate, they can lead to less than optimal outcomes. The construction of the story is a two-way process and the media may influence the story that jurors construct through pre-trial publicity. There's another set of models that are commonly used to understand juror decision making. These are the elaboration likelihood model and the heuristic systematic model. These are both known as what we call dual process models. This means they describe two ways in which things happen. The models were originally developed to understand persuasion and attitude change, but they've been adapted to the jury context because it's possible to think about a jury trial as a series of persuasive messages. Now, while there are some fine distinctions between these two models, they generally make the same predictions. So for our purposes, we'll focus on the elaboration likelihood model. 
This model describes two distinct modes or routes to persuasion, the central and peripheral routes. Each of these involves different amounts of thinking. The central route involves more effortful thinking and the peripheral route involves less thinking. We refer to the amount of thinking in terms of how much you elaborate about a persuasive message. An elaboration is measured by looking at the number of positive and negative thoughts you have about a message. So basically, if you can generate a lot of pros and cons when given a persuasive message, we would say you're showing a high degree of elaboration. For the central route, the amount of favourable elaboration about the message influences persuasion. The more that you can think of benefits compared to costs, the more you will be persuaded. For the peripheral route, the strength of the message content is less important. You're more persuaded if the message is associated with other things that are positively evaluated. For example, if you have a positive stereotype about the type of person giving you the message, you'll be more persuaded by the message. So when do we use each route? We use a central route when an issue is important to us, when we have the time and the cognitive capacity to think about the issue. We tend to use the peripheral route when there's limited time to think about the message, and when we're distracted, when the issue is not so important, and also, funnily enough, when we're in a good mood. One of the assumptions underlying all of these models of jury decision-making is that perceivers like to put in the minimum amount of cognitive effort possible. This has led to some people referring to perceivers as cognitive misers or mental sluggards. There is an alternative perspective on the, what this research means, however. We and some others think that we use stereotypes strategically to maximise the amount of information that can be stored in our brains under taxing conditions. Stereotypes help us encode some of the information so that we can then turn our attention to other parts of the information. There's actually some evidence that perceivers try to engage in as much thinking about unexpected or stereotype inconsistent information as possible. For example, Stern and colleagues in 1984 found that participants spent more time reading and thinking about stereotype inconsistent behaviours and consequently recalled a greater number of these behaviours than stereotype consistent behaviours. McRae and colleagues found that when perceivers made use of stereotypes when encoding information, those perceivers were then able to allocate more of their thinking capacity to other cognitive tasks. Findings such as these have been interpreted in terms of a strategy to maximise or optimise the amount of information encoded by perceivers. Our cognitive resources can be conserved by encoding stereotype congruent targets relatively effortlessly in terms of the relevant stereotype, allowing more effortful thinking to be used in relation to stereotype incongruent targets. Okay, so we've seen that sometimes jurors are influenced by the quality of the message or the evidence, if we're talking about a trial, and sometimes they might be influenced by some things that are independent of the quality of the message. Now, obviously, we'd want to maximise the influence of the quality of the message and minimise the influence of those things not related to the quality of the message. So in the next presentation, we'll talk about those factors that are independent of the quality of the message so that we can understand what they might be.